Hi! Welcome to Maker Fun Moments powered by Brilliant Labs. I'm Ian and I'm so glad you could join us. Did you know that there are over 200 mammal species in Canada? There are 15 land or terrestrial and 5 marine ecozones, ranging from ocean coasts, mountains to urban housing. This means that Canada can support many different types of species, including nearly half of the known cetacans. These are the aquatic group of mammals we know them best as whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Oh, awesome! We have a Maker Fun caller! Hi Ian, I'm Briella. I'm looking to calculate the age of this tree that I'm studying for a project. Now I know that you can calculate the age of a tree by counting how many light and dark rings it has on a slice of its stump. So this is super cool! But how can we calculate the age without cutting down the tree? That's a great question, Briella. You can calculate the age of a living tree by collecting three of the following elements. Circumference, which is the measurement of the outside of the circle. In this case, it's around the tree trunk. Diameter, this is the distance through the center of the circle. It's kind of hard to get, of course, with a living tree. And finally, there's something called pi. Now, I don't think it's this kind of pi. Why don't we give you this delish answer at the end of the show? In our last Maker Fun episode, we shared that the United Nations has created 17 sustainable development goals to help make our world a better and safer place. Today, we're going to be exploring goal number 15, life on land. Do you like exploring nature? I know I do. Nature provides us with our oxygen, help keep our weather patterns normal, pollinates our crops, and so much more. Today, we're going to learn about life and diversity. We'll learn about biomimicry and make a lamp. We'll talk with someone who knows a lot about the natural world, explore how a plant breathes through a microscope, and visit a dairy farm. Now, let's explore and have some maker fun. Did you know that many of the superheroes we know from movies or comics were inspired by animals with extreme abilities? Check this out. Deep in the blackness of the oceans lives a hero like no other. A hero that can withstand the pressure and heat of the Earth's core. A hero that can teach humanity about the possibilities of deep space travel. A hero that is cuter than any other kitten on YouTube. To some, it is known as a moss piglet. To others, a water bear. But to those biologists who know it best, it is tardigrade. The power of cuteness is real. Can you see me? I'm mimicking the look of a plant. Biomimicry is when humans watch and learn from nature to find solutions to problems. For example, remember learning how to tie your shoes? Didn't you love Velcro? This is a perfect example of biomimicry. Think of burdocks and how they stick to your clothes. They were the inspiration for Velcro. Now, let's explore biomimicry and design a lamp. Biomimicry is a practice that learns from and mimics the strategies found in nature to solve human design challenges. Bio means life, and mimicry means to imitate. Biomimicry is a process that allows us to seek inspiration from natural patterns, processes, and phenomena, and design something that appreciates nature's beauty, form, and function. It also enables us to find creative solutions to critical problems by observing what happens in nature. In this activity, we'll design a lamp inspired by nature. To begin, take a walk outside and find something that captures your imagination and your interest.
Pause and spend some time observing and appreciating the shape, form, and beauty of a natural object. We see amazing patterns in nature, branching, spiraling, waves. Look closely and try to imitate the shapes and patterns you see by sketching them. Try variations and different compositions. Explore how you can seek inspiration from nature to create a lampshade using different kinds of paper. This is vellum paper that I'm using. I've used the shape of a pine cone seed and the way the pine cone overlaps and spirals around itself. To make the light, get an LED and a battery pack. The long leg on the LED is the positive leg, so that connects to the red wire. Connect them by wrapping the wire around the leg and insulate and secure it with tape. Repeat for the negative leg and the black wire and you have a light. Attach your nature-inspired lampshade and you've got a lamp. It's not the final product that's important, but the observation and imitation of nature. I started out going for a pine cone shape and ended up with more of a flower. I love it anyway, and it turns out one natural process can easily lead to another. Keep exploring, keep making, and stay brilliant. Biodiversity is the term we use for many different types of animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, and other life that can be found in any ecosystem. Let's explore and learn more about biodiversity by exploring an ecosystem. Hi, I'm Rhonda Sage with Nature's Backpack and my business is down in St. Stephen, St. Andrews area in New Brunswick. I actually got interested in my field back when I was a child. I would always be outdoors exploring, building forts with my friends and um, always bringing home animals, stray animals. And through that experience, I just developed this this love of nature and being outdoors. I have done a lot of different projects in the past, but I can show you one that I actually have in my hand. So I have a journey stick that I made with a bunch of students. And what a journey stick is, is just a stick that you find out in nature. You can wander around and whichever stick that might speak to you that is sturdy enough to hold your weight when you're walking. So it's a walking stick. And then you can paint it. Um, I painted different patterns on it and then tied a crystal on it at the top. As you go through your journey out in nature, you can tie different things to it, paint different things that remind you of your journey out into nature. So this is one that I really recommend that, that you try and do yourself. Uh, every time that I go out into nature, there's things that are surprising. Uh, from new plants that I might discover, or a skull, or a feather, um, that I'm continuously learning. And it's just surprising on just how much there is to know out in nature. Would you like to go on a journey with me? Come on, let's go. We'll see what we can find while we go on a little walk. I found something out here. Is a skull, a raccoon skull. And we can go back to the beginning of the trailhead and I'll show you some other skulls that I have and how you can identify some skulls. So come on, let's go. Okay, so I have some different skulls here. And when you find a skull, you can first you can categorize it into what type of animal that or, or sizes of the animal that that you find. So if you're looking at this tiny little skull, this will tell you this is not a bear. 
this is pretty small if you compare it to my hand. Whereas this one here is a bear and see the size difference between this little guy and, and the bear. So just by seeing what type of, what size it is, um, can start you on that identification process. The other thing is to categorize it is, is it a prey or is it a predator? So a prey is an animal that is eaten by other animals and a predator is an animal that eats other animals. So the best way to find that is to look at where the eyes are. So if you look at this one, this is a deer. And if you look at it, you can see that the eye sockets of the skull are on the side of the skull. So when a deer, uh, because other animals are eat it, the deer has to be able to see almost 360 degrees all the way around its head so that it can tell if another predator is nearby. So that's why it's, its eyes are on the side, so you can see all the way around. Whereas if you look at this skull, you can see that the eyes are more in the front of, of the skull. And this is a predator. And the reason why the eyes are at the front of the skull is so that it has binocular vision, so it can see with both its eyes. And that allows the animal to have depth perception, so they can figure out how far things are um, in front of them. So that's, that is one way that you can categorize your animals. So another way when you're looking at the skull is determine what it eats. So by looking at the teeth, you can determine, is it a herbivore? Is it an animal that eats only plants? Is it a carnivore, an animal that eats only meat? Or is it an omnivore, an animal that eats both meat and plants? So when you look at this skull here, we have the incisors, the canines, the premolars, and the molars at the back. And the canines are really sharp and really, really long. And these are for like grabbing hold of prey. And then at the sides, these teeth are very pointy and kind of look like mountains, the premolars and molars. So this would tell me that this is a carnivore because its teeth are made for eating meat. Whereas when you look at an animal that is a herbivore that eats only plants, it doesn't have any incisors and its premolars and molars are very flat. You can see that they're not, don't look like mountains at all and they're not sharp, they're very, very flat. So these are teeth for grinding up plants. So this is a herbivore. And then when you look at this one, this has incisors that are really, really sharp, like the coyote, the first skull that I showed you. And then it has really like the mountainous type premolars here, but its molar at the back are kind of more flat. Do you see that? They're more flat. So this animal, which is a bear, is an omnivore. So it has, it can eat meat and it has the teeth made for grinding up its plant material. So that's another way that you can tell what type of animal it is. So with that, I would just suggest to just go out and um, have fun, see if you find some some skulls and, uh, and find some signs of animals out there and really explore just some really cool things that you can find out in nature and just bring it back. Lots of field guides out there, lots of things on the internet that you can use to help you identify. So that's what I suggest for you to do after you've watched me on this show and go out and just explore nature and see what really cool things you can find. Ah, breathing. It feels good, right? We need air to survive. But have you ever wondered how plants breathe? Let's visit Hannah and discover how they do it. Hi, I'm Hannah. Do you like science? Well, today we're exploring life diversity. all the boats to map. Have you ever wondered stuff about nature? Like 
how leaves breathe? Have you ever heard of people talking to their plants? You're so beautiful, you're so gorgeous. We need plants to breathe. But did you know they need us so they can breathe too? We're like teammates. When we breathe, we give off carbon dioxide, which plants need for photosynthesis. This is how plants make their food from the sun, sugar, also known as glucose, water, and most importantly, carbon dioxide. Plants create oxygen as a product of this process. That's why we're such good teammates. Plants use openings called stomata to allow CO2, also known as carbon dioxide, to come into the leaf. Kind of like how we breathe through our mouth or through our nose. Today, we're going to count how much stomata is on a leaf. We're going to go outside and find some leaves that have already fallen off trees. First of all, let's get all our materials ready. We're going to need clear nail polish, some invisible scotch tape, a microscope, some microscope slides, and most importantly, leaves. Step number one. On the back side of your leaf, use clear nail polish and coat a small area. Do not coat over any of the veins because that might cause our experiment to not work. Oh, I'm just gonna paint mine right now. We don't want too big of area coated, but we don't want too small of an area. So be very careful not to coat for any of the veins. Step number two. Now, we have to let our nail polish dry. We have to make sure it dries completely or else our experiment is not gonna work. Step number three. Stick a piece of tape over the coated area on the leaf and press very gently. Step number four, remove the tape and the polish carefully. Stick the tape on your glass microscope slide. This leaf had trouble peeling it all off, but that's okay. It doesn't matter if you get the whole thing or just the lid. Do the same thing for this one. Peel it off very, very carefully. Step number five, make sure your microscope is on low power. That would be the shortest one. Place your slide onto the stage and use your slide clips to hold it in place. Now, if it's not lined up with the light that we haven't turned on yet, so don't worry if there's no light, <laughs> you can use the adjustment knobs and move it to where you want it. So now we're gonna turn our microscope on and we're gonna turn this to high power. High power is gonna be the longest one. If you're having trouble finding it, you can always ask an adult for help. So now, we're gonna look into the microscope. I saw lots of little yellow dots. They're really, really tiny. And it might be hard to see, but if you look really closely, you can see a bunch. Researchers believe that somatic densities change in response to the changing levels of carbon dioxide on our planet. This may be a result of global warming. Due to the rising levels of carbon dioxide, the number of stomata per leaf may increase, allowing the plant to absorb more carbon dioxide. We can all do our part. Turn off your lights when you aren't home, grow a garden, turn on the heat when you aren't in the room, and hey, why not? Plant your own tree. That way, you can make your own team to help stop global warming. Woo! Go team! Have fun exploring stomata! It's time to move on and discover the importance of sustainable farming. Let's go. Hi, my name is Lennon. and today I had the opportunity to visit a dairy farm to learn all about the life of cows. The average cow is milked twice daily, the first time in the early morning and in an automated system. Cows may be milked more often if they choose.
in a day, cows consume between f- five and nine meals plus water as they are grieving animals because cows roam. They also spend a lot of time chewing and di- digesting their food. While individual cows' habits and like like may vary greatly, the time each spends eating and roaming uh, usually adds up to four to seven hours daily. Dairy cow feed is usually a combination of pasture, grass from the farm, and and crops such as corn, oats, or barley, sometimes containing essential vitamins and minerals. During the course of a day, cows would normally spend 10 to 12 hours lying down a lot. They would get up and down periodically. Cows also chew and digest their food multiple times with four stomachs. This is no easy task. Thanks! That was a lot of fun! I hope you're enjoying exploring with us! Now, why don't we go answer Briella's question from the beginning of the show? Pi is a ratio used in these kind of math problems, and we'll use the value of 3.14. Step 1. Using a sewing tape or string to measure the circumference. If you can, try to get the measurement about 4 feet or 1.22 meters up from the ground. If you use a string, then simply measure the length with a ruler. Step two, we need to calculate the diameter by using the circumference and the value of pi. Diameter equals circumference divided by pi. Finally, you need to identify the kind of tree to calculate the age, as each tree is different in growth factor. Once you find this information, you can calculate the age by multiplying the diameter by the growth factor. Some examples of growth factors for trees in Atlanta, Canada are oak and birch. 1.88 1.88 centimeters pine and spruce 1.13 centimeters. I hope you had fun making with us today. I know I did. What was your favorite part? Did you make along with us? We want to see your Maker Fun project. Share it with us. Visit us at brilliantlabs.ca to learn how. And remember, stay brilliant and we'll see you next time.